Well, good morning, everybody. Let's go ahead and open up to uh, Revelation chapter 6. And a little bit of review, as we certainly always do to set the table uh, for us today. Remember that we've been in this eschatology study for about eight months or so now. It's been quite some time. I know John and Frank jumped in uh, to the deep end of the pool last week as we're, you know, eight months down the road here. And, and this morning we have uh, two visitors doing the same, but that is that is great. Uh, we're so glad and thankful that you're here. It's sometimes difficult to jump into a study like this <clears throat> where we've been teaching on eschatology and end times prophecies and things for like I said, the better part, probably over eight months now. And uh, now we've gotten to the book of Revelation where we've been for the last couple months. We're we'll getting into chapter 6 where we were last week. We'll pick up there again. And just to give the disclaimer, as we have visitors and as we always do, uh, remember our view on eschatology uh, is not, uh, you know, our salvation is not contingent upon our view of eschatology. Correct. It doesn't. Uh, we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, and and that's how we're saved by believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, what our view is on eschatology, while uh, yes, it is important, it is not vital uh, that you believe the same thing that we believe and that we're teaching. Um, certainly, the pastors here, we believe uh, the view that we're teaching, the view that we're going through, and we continue to work through the scriptures to allow the scriptures and the Holy Spirit to steer us and to guide us on, on where we are. So we've built this kind of time construct over there, which we can talk about a little more later, but that's our timeline that we built before we got to the book of Revelation. Through the Old Testament, through the New Testament, uh, over six months of doing that before we got to the book of Revelation. Remember, the book of Revelation is just giving us a little more detail to start to plug in. And you can see, actually, I plugged these in from us from last week. <clears throat> with the seals and seal one starting at the beginning of that seven year, the 70th week of Daniel. And lining up those seals, we'll get to that in a moment. I think it'll be more helpful if we get back to the text. Uh, as I'll show you how we've lined up those seals, as we talked about last week, I tried to line them up accordingly. So, first couple chapters of Revelation, remember John is on the Isle of Patmos. He is writing this letter that Jesus is revealing things to him. And Jesus gave him... Uh, messages to write and to give to seven literal first century churches. And we see those in chapter 2 and 3, and we went through those letters, and certainly there's much applications for us in the church as there was for them in the first century some 2,000 years ago. So once we get to chapter 4, it says it begins with after these things, and Jesus begins to show John's things that will be taking place hereafter, or will be what? Future things. We believe that they are still future things, since they have not happened as we talk about the day of the Lord. So somebody maybe uh, give me a break real quick and tell us what do we mean when we say the day of the Lord? What does that all mean? There's a lot to, to say in those, in those three little words, or four words, day of the Lord. Uh, what does that mean? When, when you hear day of the Lord, what do we think of? Good, Christ returns, Jesus. <clears throat> yes. God. Mm -hmm. The wrath. Good. Jesus returns, the wrath of God, because um, those things coincide and happen at the same time, right? We're going to look at that again today. Uh, but as we went through the all of the discourse in Matthew 24, the days of Noah, the days of Lot. Um, so what's the first thing that happens at the day of the Lord of Jesus coming? What's the first thing that happens? Sun, moon, and stars. Okay, good. So that's the sign of the day of the Lord. So that will happen. Then we will see Jesus coming in the clouds. <clears throat> and what will happen right after that? Good, the first resurrection, or the rapture, right? That will happen at that time. And then after that, the wrath of God will be poured, poured out. Okay, so those things coincide <coughs> on the same time, the same day, uh, the day of the Lord. And so we do not believe and we do not teach uh, or understand that Scripture says that day will happen today, that it could happen at any time, that it could happen uh, today, and, and we could all be whisked out of here, and it's secret, and no one knows, and the world doesn't know what happens. The kind of left behind, uh, that's called the pre-tribulational dispensational rapture. That's certainly not the view that we teach. Uh, it is the view that the majority of the church teaches, and I understand that. <clears throat> and it was the view that I used to have up until about nine or ten years ago. So we don't teach that because we've already gone through a lot of, like I said, I don't want to recap eight months we do have it all on the youtube channels if, if you're interested i can get you uh you know you can get access to to go back and study those things but we see that there are signs in the scriptures that that will happen before 
Jesus returns. So you've talked about some of them. The one that happens right before he comes is the signs of the day of the Lord. The sun and moon and stars are being darkened. What would some of the other signs be that would happen before that? Okay, the Antichrist will be on the scene. He will be revealed at what's called the what? Abomination and desolation. Good, abomination and desolation. And when does that happen in the seven-year period? Halfway. Halfway point, right in the middle, Daniel 12, right? Daniel 9, Daniel 12. <clears throat> so at the middle, the Antichrist will be revealed. He will go in the temple, remember, and set himself up to be God. He will put in a statue uh, or an idol of himself and say to worship me. He will start to tell people to take the mark, which we'll get into right later in Revelation here. And so things will change there. And that is when the Great Tribulation will start. Okay, we're going to talk a lot, a lot about that uh, more today. Because the Tribulation is a time of, of trouble for who? Everybody. True, everybody, but specifically who? The Tribulation is for who? For believers, right? For the church. Um, the Tribulation is not the time of God's wrath for this entire seven-year period. So we're going to talk a lot more about defining words and the meaning of words and how they've changed a little bit. We're going to talk about that uh, more. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Let's get um, back into chapter 6. <clears throat> we read through the whole thing last week. We're going to read again and go through uh, the end of it and, uh, and get into some of our notes here. <clears throat> Verse 1 says, <clears throat> Then I saw, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to ask somebody else to read so I can say my voice a little bit. Anybody can read uh, starting in verse 1 and just read the whole chapter for us, chapter 6. Thank you. Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying uh, with a loud voice of thunder, Come. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. When he broke the third seal, I heard the, uh, I heard the third living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, a black horse. He who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice, the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. And I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death, and Hades was following with him. Authority was given to him over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence, and by the wild beasts of the earth. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain. The testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from the judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer, until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth, as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Then the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the commanders, and the rich, and the strong, and every slave, and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Whew. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we love you. <clears throat> Thankful for this text. Thankful for... Every text that you give us, thanks for your word and precious gift that it is to us as you continue to grow us and teach us and equip us to be more like you. So we certainly ask that you would be our teacher and, and that you would do a work in us here this morning. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so last week we did, we went through the first four seals. <clears throat> we did get through the fifth and sixth seals towards the end quickly. Um, so I'm going to review a little bit of those. But remember, those first four seals, let me pop up this slide real quick. So the first four seals, we have the 
white horse, the red horse, the black tail horse, and the ashen horse or the pale horse. So uh, that first one, you know, we talked about probably being the Antichrist coming on the scene, the white horse, the one who is coming on the horse with a crown and a bow to conquer. Okay, we'll look at the Matthew 24 thing in a moment. I just wanted to get those seals up for you. <clears throat> so the second one is to take peace or to kill. Um, you know, wars and rumors of wars, as Jesus talks about in Matthew 24. And remember, the reason we have them lined up here is because when we do a comparison, it seems like John, as he's going through Revelation 6 and 7 with the seals, is following the same exact order that Jesus taught him in the Olivet Discourse, okay? They seem to parallel and mimic each other perfectly, okay? And we're going to go to that a little bit more here today. So the third one, we have the balances and the scales, uh, which seems to indicate that there's a famine because the price of what they're saying with the food costing so much that it will cost a day's wages for a single portion of food. So it seems like it's very expensive because supply and demand is, is upset and that there's famines and things going on. Okay, um, the fourth one is the pale horse, which is death, and there's going to be hunger and sword and pestilence and famine and all these things that are going to be happening. <clears throat> and then as we get now to the fifth seal, let me make it a little bigger so you can see it. So as we get to the fifth seal, there's these martyrs under the altar. And remember, where is John right now when he's seeing all this? John's in heaven, in the spirit, and he is having these things revealed to him. As in chapter 4, he starts with the throne room of God and seeing all these visions and all these things. He sees under the altar souls of martyrs, those who have been killed for the cause of Christ. And what are they saying? Remember, they're saying, how long, O Lord, before you avenge our death on those people? So, remember, in this we see... They're asking, when is that going to happen? When are you going to judge these people and pour out your wrath upon them? Which tells us that what hasn't happened yet is that has not been poured out yet. So if they're asking how long before your wrath is coming, how long before you judge them, it means that has not happened yet. So we're at the fifth seal, and up to that point, that is not the wrath of God. Are you guys with me? The seven-year period has started, and it is not the judgment of God. It is not the wrath of God upon the people yet. For us, that makes sense, because when does that happen? After the day of the Lord, which has not commenced yet. Okay? So when we get to the sixth seal, we see a little change here. <coughs> we already said that. Okay, so in the sixth seal, we see there's a great earthquake, and lo and behold, what happens in the sixth seal? The sun, the moon, and stars are darkened. That is the sign, Joel 2.32, all through, I think we looked at like nine other prophets that write about it. It's also on Acts 2 as well. The sign of the day of the Lord and Christ's second coming is the sun and the moon and stars will be darkened. So it's great that we should see that somewhere in Revelation, and this is where we see it. It's at the sixth seal. That is when that happens. And so for us, that should be a big, you know, flashing neon sign of what? The day of the Lord is here. Okay, so the day of the Lord is now here. That is where we say the first resurrection and the rapture will happen. And now after that, what should we expect to see happen? After the rapture on the day of the Lord, what should we expect to see happen? Yes, him in the clouds. He takes us up, and then what will commence after that? Wrath of God will be poured out. Okay, judgment of God will pour out. So when we look at those last few verses there, 15, 16, 17, we see... Uh, this is coming from Isaiah. Isaiah says this, uh, that the kings of the earth, and, the, and they will all uh, be crying out and yelling to the rocks and the mountains to fall on us. And look in verse 17 why they say that. Because they look at the lamb, which is Jesus, right? They say the wrath of the lamb, and the great day of the wrath has come, or has now come, or is at hand. Do you see that? Right now. Which again says that his wrath had not happened prior to that right does that make sense logical deduction means if the day of the lord the wrath has come now at the sixth seal now the wrath is here and it hadn't happened before that <clears throat> so <clears throat> excuse me we will be taken out of the way right in the rapture in the first resurrection so that the wrath of god will then be poured on the wicked because god's wrath first thessalonians 5 9 is not, we're not appointed for God's wrath, right? Believers are not appointed to God's wrath, which is why the tribulation, remember, cannot be God's wrath. Is God's wrath in the tribulation killing his own people? Is that God's wrath, cutting off the heads of, of believers? No, that's the wrath of the Antichrist and the wrath of Satan, which is why it's tribulation 
for the church. It's a trial. It's testing. It's tribulation like all through scriptures we see. You will suffer persecution and tribulation in this life, right? That's what this life of a believer will look like. So it, it lines up well and makes sense, yes? <clears throat> so as I put this slide back up, um, I want us to go back to Matthew 24. Please go ahead and flip back to Matthew 24 if you would. <clears throat> While we're doing that, certainly any thoughts, comments, input. Now that we have these lined up a little bit, I want us to walk through the all the discourse again and see these things um, step by step. But maybe something stuck out to you this morning that didn't hit you last week or the last eight months or something to, to kind of interject that I uh, maybe didn't articulate well or something I missed. Any any thoughts or comments? I would just say if you're new that that top part of the chart is the one week on the bottom part of the chart <coughs> if everybody's not following. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so this is a big, <clears throat> huge timeline here that goes all the way to the new heaven, new earth. Here we have the millennial kingdom, which we haven't gotten to yet. This is the 70th week of Daniel, or the seven-year period that you hear a lot of church will call it the seven-year tribulation or something like that. We don't call it that because we don't see it that way. <clears throat> Scriptures don't call it that, um, so we'll get into that a little bit more later. But to Jill's point, this top thing is just this week kind of... If you take your phone and blow it up, right, and stretch it out, blow it up so we can get into it a little bit more in that seven-year period. So right up to the millennium there. That's the seven-year period of the 70th week of Daniel. Good. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so if you see how I've tried to line these up um, with the Olive Discourse, we will see as Jesus moves forward, it sounds like exactly how these seals uh, are going to to unpack. And, and remember, who is the one breaking the seals causing these things to happen? Jesus, Jesus right? Mm -hmm. And who is the one who is orchestrating all things to happen exactly how he wants them to happen? Jesus, right? So he is the one who's given the revelation to John. He is the one who's given the revelation to us. Remember, it's for us to understand things. It's not, God's word is not to be encrypted and he's only gifted certain men in certain periods of time to, to tell you the key of all the allegories and spiritualizing things. He wants us to understand the things he wants us to understand, right? Yes, ma'am. How about how much time frame is this with all these seals being broken? <clears throat> Do we know? Well, we'll talk about it in a minute. Okay. So if you look over there, it'll kind of be helpful. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to line up well with what we're going to do. <clears throat> so let's start through Matthew 24. Again, we've gone through this in depth a few months ago uh, and preaching when we went through Mark 13. So I'll go through quickly. I just want to kind of see some rapid points here um, as we go through. Jesus says uh, that many <clears throat> will be killed and many will fall away, okay, because of uh, their love of Christ will fall away is what the implications are. And he says those who endure till the end, remember, let me back up. Remember what he's answering. This is in his earthly ministry, and he's answering questions posed to him in the first two verses by the disciples. Remember, what are those questions? Anybody How remember? Or you can look. How will we know the end of the, end of the time? Good. So how are we going to know these things about the temple they're asking and they're asking about uh, about your coming, which would be his second coming, right? And of the signs of the end of the time and the end of the end of the age. Because remember, when Jesus comes at a second coming, it's the end of this age we're currently in, right? And the beginning of a new age, of a different age. So when is that all going to happen? They want to know. And again, he does not say there are no signs you should be looking for. Do not worry about it. That's not for you to know about. Don't be concerned. Uh, you're going to be whisked away out of here. You don't need to know any of that. Instead, he builds a long discourse to tell them exactly what they should be looking for and what they should be ready for and be watching for. Okay, that's, that's a different uh, difference there. So they say in verse 3, tell us when these things will happen and what it will look like. Okay, he says in verse 4, see to it that no one misleads you. For many will come saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. Well, who would that be? False prophets. We could call them antichrists. Yes, the antichrist we see here being mentioned first. Verse 6, he says, you'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars, but that is not yet the end. Verse 7, famines and earthquakes. And all this is just the beginning of birth pangs. Okay, remember, it's just the beginning of the process. The birth pangs, remember, they're going to be more intense and more intense and more longer in duration as this thing progresses forward. Okay, so it's going to continue to intensify. Verse 9, he says, they will deliver you 
to tribulation. They will kill you, and you'll be hated by all for my namesake. And many will fall away, or the word there also would be offended. Many false prophets will arise, and they will mislead many. <clears throat> but, verse 13, he who endures to the end, he shall be saved. Then the end will come. Therefore, key verse here, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is spoken of through Daniel the prophet, that's a big key in the Olivet Discourse, right? Pointing back to Daniel, pointing to the abomination of desolation, which we've talked about, happens in the middle of the week. Yes? What okay. verse are you in? Um, verse 15. Okay, the abomination of desolation. <clears throat> now, is that specific to Daniel that he mentions the abomination of desolation? In other words, I can look mm -hmm. those words up and it's in Daniel? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Daniel 9, um, da Daniel 9 through 12, you'll see a lot of... That's why he's. That's why Jesus is pointing us back to. He's saying to them. He's saying, "You want to know what's going to look like? Here's some of the signs. Here's some of the things you need to be looking for. And remember what Daniel the prophet spoke about hundreds and hundreds of years ago in the past. When you understand what he's talking about and you see what he's talking about, that's another sign. Yeah, to be looking for what Daniel spoke of. So it's a prophecy that will be fulfilled. Yeah. But did Daniel actually use those words, abomination of desolation? Yeah. Daniel 12, 11, it says something about that. Just okay. Yeah, good, thank you. Yeah, it'll also be through 9 through 10, all those chapters in there of Daniel yep. um, talk about this. <laughs> good, and so does uh, Paul later in Thessalonians talks about the Antichrist being revealed. God and those things, and that's what we call, and what Jesus calls the abomination of desolation. It's a great question. So he says, when you see that, do these things and, and continue to look and be praying, look in verse 20, that your flight be not w on winter or on the Sabbath. And, and the other versions say uh, different things as well there. Verse 21, he says, then there will be great tribulation, such as never occurred since the beginning of the world or until now or even will. So when did he just mention the tribulation will start? Look at the order. After the abomination of desolation. Do you see it? After the abomination of desolation, when you see that, for then there will be, right? Then there will be, giving chronological order, giving an order to these things. So after the abomination of desolation, which happens when? In the middle. After the midpoint, there will be a time of tribulation. This is the only place in the scriptures where you hear this any time frame of, of this seven-year time frame called tribulation. Then there will be tribulation. Verse 22, and unless those days, the days, what days? The days of tribulation. For, for you, for the saints, for the church. Unless they be cut short, no life would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So who is the elect? The saints, the church, for us. Meaning what? You will be there for that great tribulation. And I will cut the great tribulation short because of your sake. For, for you, I will stop this. So now picture where we are in Revelation 5 with the souls of the martyrs saying, how long before you do this? You see it? How long until you do this? And his answer to them is, hold off and wait just a little longer, back in Revelation 6, until the other brothers and sisters who are appointed, as you were, to give their lives for the cause of Christ, when that happens, it'll, I will come, and it'll be over. Right? Because he is God, he is sovereign. Does he know and has chosen exactly how many martyrs there will be in the history of mankind? Yes, he has. You see it? When the last one is martyred, in, in the great tribulation time, at, and right before he's going to come, when that last one comes, it's, that it's been appointed, he will come at exactly the appointed time, right? No surprises, again, with the Lord. He's not going to be caught off guard by anything. He has worked it all out, and it is all penned in his book and written out, and it's going to happen exactly how he has set for it to, to happen, right? Are we with it? Good. Good. So, that will be cut short. <clears throat> well, what would the tribulation then be cut short by? How is he going to cut it short? How does he cut it short or stop all that from happening? Good. Exactly. The day of the Lord. He says, I've told you in advance. Look at verse 25. And he's taught them this before. We've gone to Matthew 13 and also Luke 17, and he talks about this. Look at verse 27. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west... So will the coming of the Son of Man be? What what would that imply? What would that say to us? Huh? It's going to be quick. 
quick, but also what? The lightning from the east to the west. Visible. Visible. Revelation 1-7. Uh, every eye will see it happen. It's not a secret. It's not some secret thing that people aren't going to understand and know what happened. Certainly believers, remember, when we go back to 1 Thessalonians 5, and be children of the darkness and children of the light. Remember that? That, that, that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Right? To non-believers. Right. Because that's what I say. The, the majority of church would say, well, that means he comes secretly and no one knows. Is that what that means? That he comes like a thief in the night? Does it mean he's going to come in secret and no one will know? What does it mean? That the non-believers won't be ready and it's going to be a secret to them, but the believers would be ready and know that. Right. Because the, and why do we believe that? Because I told you to believe that? No, because that's what the Bible says. Good. The next couple of verses in First Thessalonians 5 say, you are children of the light and not children of darkness, so that that day will not fall upon you as a thief. Why? Because you're supposed to be watching. You're supposed to be ready. You're supposed to be the watchman up on the, on the, on the tower and watching and looking out for God's people, and looking out for yourself and understanding for yourself what it is that you are to be watching and ready for. Uh, again, over and over and over through scriptures, watch. We'll get there in a minute. Watch. Be ready. Be prepared. Why do you need to be watching and be looking and be prepared if there's nothing to be looking for and be prepared for? Okay, so that's the key, is we are in the day, and no one will miss it. It will not be a surprise. It will just be for us. It will be, we know our redemption is here. Now, it'll be, we'll be, you know, it'll be a glorious thing for us because now's the time. We get to go right now and get our glorified bodies. Uh, I mean, it's, it's on now. We get to be in the presence of the Lord in our glorified bodies forever worshiping Him. That's the day we're all supposed to anxiously be looking for, right? That's, that's why we do uh, endure the things of life, because we know that our salvation is assured in Christ Jesus, and we one day have heaven as our home. I mean, that's what it's all about for us. So he says, as that happens, and look at verse 28. Here's another little uh, kind of analogy, if you will. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures were gathered. Well, think about that as another kind of this birth pang idea of, well, what does that mean? Well, we've talked about that a little bit. What does the lightning from the east and west mean? We've talked about that a little bit. You will see it. You will know because you're supposed to be watching. Well, as the carcass is and there the vultures will be, picture actually yesterday we were out here playing volleyball and you guys saw the big gathering of birds, uh, right, Matt and all those who were playing. So picture that's like a mile down the road. You see these vultures gathering up in, in the sky. You don't, you don't know what's happened and what the scene looks like, but what do you pretty much know has happened? There's something dead there. Right? There's something dead there. There's a carcass on the side of the road that, that, that the vultures are all around. And as you get closer and closer and closer, what becomes more evident? Perhaps a smell comes in. Perhaps you see flies and stuff coming around. As you get closer, what do you finally see? You finally see the body. You see uh, a dead possum or something. You understand what it is. Do you see that? That's, that's the picture. As you get closer, it's going to become more clear. Right? And that's certainly going to be the case in, in this. As we move closer through these times, the Lord and through His Spirit and by His Word that we're supposed to be knowledgeable about, He's going to continue to unpack to us more and more what this looks like. Okay? So we're to be prepared. Now verse 29, he says, But immediately after the tribulation of those days, we just talked about the tribulation of those days, starts after the abomination of desolation, and he says, after the tribulation, the sun will be dark, the moon will not give its lights, and the stars will fall from the sky. What does that sure sound like? The signs of the day of the Lord all through Scripture. So either I'm crazy and you guys should just not allow me to teach anymore, or I believe Jesus is talking about the same event Paul's talking about, and the same event Joel wrote about, the same event Daniel's talking about, the same event John is writing about in Revelation. It's all the same thing that there's not a secret one, that one of them is writing about a different one than the other one did. I, I don't believe that for one second. Okay, so if we line it up and it's all talking about the same event, Jesus says the sign of the sun, moon, and stars are darkened. What is that the sign of? The day of the Lord. What should we see happen next? His coming, right? Look at verse 30. Then the signs of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. All the tribes will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory, with his angels and a great trumpet. They will gather together as elect. What is that? What do we call that? The rapture, the glorious first resurrection. That's what we're talking about. He says it happens after the tribulation. Nowhere in Scripture will you see or find one that he says happens before the tribulation. Okay? So, if you follow with me, let me kind of try to lead us over here where we put the seals up. 
first seal will start, and it's the Antichrist on the scene. It's famines, it's wars. It's essentially natural things that he is amping up, right? That's what it looks like in the beginning of the seven-year period. When we get to the fifth seal, that's all the martyrs we heard about. When is this going to happen? When is this going to happen? He says, after the rest of the martyrs are killed, then the time will be. So I've lined that up with the abomination of desolation. Because what happens at the abomination of desolation? The Antichrist pulls his mask off and reveals himself for who he is. And as we move forward in Revelation, we're going to see he implements this sign in your hand or on your forehead that you cannot buy or sell. And if you do not take these things and you do not worship him, what happens? He'll kill you. Okay, so it seems to line up pretty well to me with the fifth seal. And there's going to be more martyrs. Where are the martyrs going to come from? He's going to kill them. Okay, so that's going to happen at the midpoint somewhere. But then we know the sixth seal is what? The signs of the day of the Lord. So from the sixth seal, from the middle to the sixth seal, from seal five to seal six is actually what? That's actually the time of great tribulation. Do you see it? Abomination, desolation, seal five starts the tribulation of killing of the saints. Seal six is the signs of the day of the Lord. And Jesus, look at it right there in verse 29 in your own Bible. He says, after the tribulation, meaning when the sun, and moon, and stars darken, the tribulation is already over. Do you follow me? Because logical deduction means if it's after the tribulation, the tribulation is over. So the tribulation only lasts this little amount of time that we don't know. I don't know how long that's going to be. But it's from the fifth seal to the sixth seal. So follow with me now, if you will. This may be like, especially to some of you new people, this may be like uh, drinking from a fire hydrant here over the next couple of minutes, but bear with me. <laughs> Verbiage is important. Pastor Brian and I, you know, are very particular about how we say things, and we certainly try to help correct each other, and we try to help correct you guys with one another of how we say things and, and understanding what we mean by what we say. And we want to know when you say something, what do you mean by that? Uh, because I take it to mean something else. This has been what skewed and clouded this teaching of eschatology since the early 1800s, when this new, this left behind kind of thing, this pre-trip thing came about, which was only less than 200 years ago. It's nowhere in the church before that, okay? The church did not ever teach until the last 180 years of this secret Jesus can return at any time. This is a new teaching. They have called this and labeled the seven-year period what? The seven-year tribulation. So do you see the problem with verbiage? If the tribulation is seven years, and they say the seven-year tribulation is the wrath of God. Do you see a couple things that should stick out to you as red flags on that? What's some problems with saying those two things? Well, the wrath is after, not during. After the tribulation. Right. The wrath is after the tribulation. And if we were to, to say, if I were to say to a pastor or to another churchgoer that knows their left-behind thing well, okay, like I do, they would say, well, that's impossible because that means it's after the seven years. Because you see in their mind, the tribulation is the whole seven-year period. And the whole seven-year period is the wrath of God, which is why we have to be raptured out secretly before the seven years. Because God's wrath's not for us. But we've already segregated that before we even got in Revelation, that the tribulation is not God's wrath. Right? So when I say to you, pre-trib, what people would think is before the seven years. In our thinking, where's pre-trib? Tribulation don't happen over here. So pre-trib would actually be halfway in to the seven-year period. You guys see me? And post-trib, meaning after the tribulation, would be where? Anything after the sixth seal on. Follow me? Post-trib in their mind means after the seven-year period. So when I say and have this discussion, even with other pastor friends, which I've had many times with many pastors, they're like, you believe in a post-trib rapture? And I'm like, yeah, I do believe in a post-trib rapture. And they say, we're not going to be here for the whole seven years of God's wrath? Like, that's wrong. You're like, how can you even be a pastor and say that? We're not appointed to God's wrath. Do you see how we're on two total different wavelengths? And for me to unpack what they've learned and what they believe those words mean and unpack them, I've spent the last nine months trying to do it to a lot of you right now. And I did this, what, three years ago in the men's Bible study? And, and did it for over a year, trying to unpack a lot of this stuff that we've been taught and unlearn it and let the scriptures teach us what words mean and what the time frames are. 
Does, does that make sense? So the time of the tribulation is, boom, right here, this little bit. And that's it. And then God's, we will be gone, and God's wrath will be poured out. Which is why Jesus says in verse 29, after the tribulation, doesn't Jesus teach a post-tribulation rapture? He quite certainly does. He says, after the tribulation, the sun and moon and stars will be darkened, and then you'll see me come in the clouds to gather my elect. He teaches post-trib rapture. But that does not mean it's after the seven years. It means it's after the sixth year. So we can stop there, certainly. And so what do other people think about God saying he's going to end it? And there's all kinds of thoughts. I don't mean to cut you off. But I, we're, just con we're just contrasting right now with the main view of the left behind <laughs> There's so certainly in other. In the camps. Left Behind series, what do they say about the verse? About Which is called, I don't want to call it Left Behind. I do that because most of us are familiar with that. What is that called? What is the Left Behind thing called? The pre tribulation rapture, which is a dispensational teaching, which we went over that all at the beginning. So, sorry, yes, honey, go ahead. Just, just what, is, what do they say about God saying he's going to stop it? For, stop what? Stop the tribulation. The they say that the entire time of the seven years is tribulation and it's God's wrath. However, they say that at the midpoint, it is a greater tribulation, that there's more people being killed. But God says he's going to stop it. I know. So what do they say about They that? say it's the Battle of Armageddon at the end. Oh, they think it's the Battle of Armageddon. At the end of the seven years, he will put a stop to that. Some of the things, though, that kind of confuse me on it are the idea that he... In, in certain areas of the Bible, he talks about uh, Magog coming down and Gog and a few of these things where it's going to be the battle of the Armageddon. Sure. And, and Gog and Magog is actually a different battle. We'll get to that in the future. Oh, okay. um, he's talking about a battle even... The battle of Gog and Magog happens after the Millennial Kingdom, after the Thousand Years. Oh. It's totally separate than Battle of Armageddon. But some in that camp say it is the same, and some of that camp say it's a different battle. There's a lot of different thoughts. But that's, that's going to be many months off in the future. We will get there, I promise. Lord willing. Lord willing. Ezekiel 38. Sorry? Is that Ezekiel 38? I believe so. Ezekiel somewhere, right, about Gog and Magog. And, and so later in Revelation, it talks about that battle of Gog and Magog, again pointing back to Old Testament scriptures that you're referring to, just like how Jesus does here and says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. So he's saying, go look at what that was about and see what that was about. So um, we, we will certainly talk about that later. Now, that battle in Ezekiel did happen, but he's talking about a battle later, and he's pointing us back to that one and saying it's going to be it's gonna be a similar kind of, kind of thing. So the first three and a half years is the tribulation, and the, first, the great tribulation is in the year, year and a half, two, what do we don't know? And there, well, no, for us, for us, the tribulation doesn't start at the beginning. Where does the tribulation start? Doesn't it start at the first seal? Because that's still tribulation. Maybe, no. no, it wouldn't no. be. And that's what I'm saying. Because he says, let's, let's let the Bible again be our instructor, not me. Verse 15 of Matthew 24, all of the discourse. Jesus gives a timeline and says, when you see the abomination of desolation, when is that? Oh, the okay. middle. Then he says, there will be a time of great tribulation. So the great tribulation starts after the midpoint. That's why it only goes from that little undisclosed time from that black line to that red line. But you feel like there's tribulation between the first seal and the fourth seal. There's still tribulation. Well, there's, there's tribulation right now. Thank you. Right. That's I know. What I was that's what I'm saying. So, but not the great tribulation doesn't Right. Not the tribulation. greatest tribulation that will ever <laughs> be seal. is what he's talking about. Which will be what? Why is it the greatest tribulation the church will ever see? What's going to happen? The Antichrist is going to be the world ruler, and he's going to be against Christians and killing them. That's not just in Africa. And China, that's everywhere. That's, that's right. Thank you. And that's what uh, uh, Matt was saying. And so, no, that's great because you guys probably didn't hear that back there. Yeah, tribulation happens for a believer every day, all the time. Seven people, on average, uh, will be killed today uh, by, by the latest poll numbers last couple of years for the cause of Christ, today. So, in other words, <coughs> rapture, quote unquote, mm -hmm. is going to be identical to the start of the uh, Lord's wrath. Okay, same Earth. time you mean, yeah. In other words, we're out of here mm -hmm. because it's a trib time. And so, however you want to call the day of the Lord, yeah. we're going out of here. Right. And then... God's going to have his wrath, the wrath on the earth. That's correct. Same day, same time. And we're going to get to that right now. We're going to continue in Matthew 24. But we yes. don't know the time of that 
Well, we're going to talk about that in a moment. Okay. So, but we do know what we believe and what I'm teaching is that we know, I know that day won't happen today. And it won't happen before the seven years starts. Because there's signs. Has it started? There's signs. No, I don't believe so. But I can't say dogmatically no. Because we will know when it has started because why? What are some of the signs we will know? They have Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Yep. And that's already happened. And wasn't so, it then supposed to be in uh, a generation when Israel became a nation again? I would say no. I would say I know that thought, uh, but I would say no. There's dual fulfillment, and we'll talk about that later. Um, we can talk about that later. But let's get back to Matthew 24 and the key of all of it. Look at verse 32. This is significant because he says, now here's another parable or another picture. We've seen the birth pangs. We've seen the carcass. You know, we've seen the um, lightning and all those things. He says, now learn the parable of the fig tree. When its branches have already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So what's the implications? When you see the signs of these things happening, you know what comes next, and you know what time it is. And you know when the garden's sprouting out there, and Brian's got his, you know, his little baby uh, leaves going and all that stuff, we know that it's time. Okay, so, and interesting enough, back in, in chapter 6 of Revelation, where we are, it says fig tree there as well. John uses fig tree back there, if you look at that. So that's pretty significant. So he says, when you see, verse 33, all these things, all what things? All the things he just unpacked when you see light, when you see wars and rumors of wars and antichrist and false prophets, the abomination of desolation, uh, you know, the sun and the stars are darkened, and the sign of me coming in the clouds together left. He said, when you see all those things start to happen, recognize, verse number three, or know that he is near right at the door. He who? Jesus coming for you that he's near and right at the door. And Mark's gospel says, look up. When you see all these things, he says, look up for your redemption draws near. Like it happens now. He says, when you see all those things happen, look up, it's go time, be ready. As soon as you see the sun and the stars darkened, be ready anytime. That, that he's gonna take us up at any moment now. So, it can't happen that he could take us up at any moment right now because have those things happened yet? Has, has the abomination of desolation happened? Are the sun and stars darkened right now? Then no, then it can't happen right now. See it? This generation will not pass away until all these things come to place. So there you go, John. Uh, we've taught through this and preached through this in Mark, but that would mean he's speaking in, in context of the generation he's speaking to in the first century. Okay, not, not to, to us, because there were fulfillments for then, and there's still certain fulfillments for the future as well. Okay, let's look at the next thing. Let's look at that day, verse 36, because this is a confusing one for the other camp too. But of that day, an hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son of Man, uh, nor the Son, <clears throat> but the Father alone. So, if no man knows the hour of the time, right, and that's what, that's what the other camp says, that's what the preacher of teaching is, it could happen today, because no man knows the, the hour of the time, it's, it's secret, therefore it could happen today, because you don't know when it could happen right? That's right. I don't know when it could happen, but I do know what I believe the Bible tells me, that it can't happen today. Because why? Because he's already given us a plethora of signs to be looking for, and follow me here, to be a good teacher and divider of the word, I don't believe you could use verse 36 to, to teach a pre-tribulation rapture. Of that day, circle that, underline, that day. What day? What day and hour has he been talking about? His coming of the day of the Lord, which he says in detail comes after the tribulation, comes after the abomination of desolation, and after all the other things he listed. That's the day he's talking about. So when he says that, he's already told you signs to be looking for before that day. Are you guys with me? So there is no secret thing that we should think that he's coming today when he's told us there's many signs that will happen first of that day. So do you see why you can't use that verse to teach a pre-trib rapture could happen today? Because what day is he talking about in context? The day that happens after all those things, after the tribulation. Doesn't it also say somewhere you will know the season? Yeah, that's what so, he's been saying the entire right. time. Yeah, the entire time he's been saying that. So, uh, let me wrap up this thing with a pretty little bow if I can, then we'll have a couple minutes. 
uh, the coming of the Son of Man, verse 37, will be just like the days of Noah. Well, that's significant. And when we go back to, uh, you can look at Matthew 13 later and Luke 17 later for homework. And he also says in there, the days of Noah and the days of Lot. Why is that important? For in the days, look at verse 38, before the flood, they were eating and drinking. Who's they? All the other people. Yeah. Eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand. Why? Because they're children of the darkness. Noah was what? Child of the light. Right? Same as Thessalonians. Same as the day of the Lord coming for us. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. So... The second coming of Christ and the rapture and the wrath to come on the day of the Lord will be just like the days of Noah, just like the day of Lot. What was significant about that? Same exact day. The same exact time frame at the same exact event. Noah was saved and the rest were not. Lot was saved and the rest were not. Noah and Lot were not saved and then seven years later, God's wrath came upon the people. It's the same event, same timeline. And he says, when the Son of Man comes... It'll be exactly like that because there's been many days of the Lord throughout history. We're just waiting for the big, if you will, day of the Lord, okay, the ultimate last day of the Lord. And then look at what he describes. Look at verse 40. Then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. What is that talking about? The first resurrection, right? Some will be taken and some will be left. Therefore, verse 42, be on alert. Be watching. Be looking, be prepared, be ready. For what? For everything I just unpacked for you. He says one will be taken, one will be left. But then he says, when they ask him, when his apostle asks him, taken where? Then he says, wherever there's a body is, there he will be gathered again. So it's almost like, is, is he talking about taking somebody and, and uh, destroying them with his wrath? Or? Well, I would say yes. <clears throat> because when you look at it, <clears throat> look at the verse before. Uh... Look at verse 39. They, being the, the non-believing world, did not understand until the flood came and what? Took them. Who are the ones that are taken? This, this is the ultimate thing. Yeah. And I'll leave this and we'll have a couple minutes. The biggest ultimate thing about the Left Behind series is that they actually got it. I think they got all of it wrong. But they actually got the whole concept of theirs backwards. Who does it say are the ones who are taken? The ones in the flood. The ones who are taken are the ones who are taken in judgment. Who are the ones who are left behind? Believers. The believers aren't taken and the others are left behind. The ones who are taken are taken in judgment. That they are taken, we are left behind. And when you go to Matthew 13, the parable of the wheat and tares, you'll see he says, gather first the tares in bundles to be burned and then gather what? The wheat into my barn. He separates them and then collects us in and burns them. You see it? Mm -hmm. So the ones who are taken are taken and bundled for burning. Those are the non-believers. And then we, the believers, are the ones left in the group and taken into his barn. But Noah was kind of the opposite. Noah got on the, the boat and then the rest were swept away. In judgment. And that's what it says. They are the ones taken. Yeah. So who was the one left behind? Noah. Noah. Mm -hmm. Who's the ones left behind? We are. Left yeah, behind we, isn't all the and they're, they have a good mystery. You see what I'm saying? So it's it's funny. That's just a little funny tidbit yeah. that is kind of totally backwards. No. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sky, one more time. <laughs> the day of the Lord also knows the first resurrection. Is that the time when the dry bones will be lifted up as well, or is that later on? That's a great question that... I can't answer in 30 seconds. <laughs> All that stuff will be, uh, we can certainly talk about it more later, um, you and I for sure. Um, there's some different prophecy implications with that, I would say. So most of this is all dealing with who is alive on earth at that time. Indeed, indeed. Because, I mean, we may be the generation or we may not. We don't know how long uh, the Lord may tarry for another thousand years. We don't know when that's going to happen. And do you see the point of, <clears throat> of that day and hour? No one knows. Do you see how that can still make sense? That we have a post-trib rapture. Have I narrowed down where we can know a day? That day or that hour. Now, he's given us signs to lead up to it. Yes? And when we...
Then after that happens, what? Then it's imminent. Then he comes at any time. So you don't know. Is it going to be 30 seconds after that happens? Is it going to be a week after that happens? Is it going to be a day after that happens? I have no idea. I just know he says, when you see that happen, be ready, it's about to happen. So do you see how I still don't know the day or hour? Even believing what, what I'm teaching and saying, that it's post-trib, because Jesus says it's post-trib, we still don't know the day or hour. But it's within two and a half years. Right, we know, a, we know a time window, right? We know to be ready and looking for it. Not to be not willing and, and ready to accept that, no, it can happen now anytime. I, I'm, ready, I'm ready to go today, Lord. I mean, I hate to tell you, I just, I believe your Bible says it's not happening today. It may happen today for you personally. It may happen today for me personally, right? Because any one of us could die and be taken to heaven at any time. But this event of the day of the Lord, I believe the Bible clearly says, cannot happen today. In That's my abomination of desolation. We need to be running and hiding. We need to be caught. We need to stand up for God. And we need to be what when that happens? We need to be front row. We need to be front row fighting the battle and telling people, instructing people, and teaching them, look, this is what the scriptures say about this. This is where we are. We'll pull, out, we'll pull this out for everybody at that time. This is where we are, right? This is where we are in the timeline. Didn't you know? Didn't you write it down? Didn't you take a picture, Catherine? So you understand what I'm saying, though? We're to be used greatly, I believe, at that time because we can help people steer them and guide them in a true understanding. And there's certainly many people all around the world that have a, a concept of right understanding that will be helpful too. But the problem is I believe the majority of the church is in the darkness on all this. And you can see what a problem that will cause. And he says, he who loses their life shall find it, and he who tried to save his life shall lose it too. That's the Good. Good. So the, the witnesses now are in the millennium then. I'm sorry? Oh, the two witnesses? Yeah. No, we'll talk, we'll talk about that coming up too. They will be in the seven years. They'll, they'll, After the day of the Lord? Mm-hmm. And we're out of here. Right. We are. Yeah. But uh, that's going to be an interesting one that I don't want to get I, into I just, yet. But for, a great question. Frame. But no, it, they will be in the seven years. Yeah. Yep. Last three and a half. Good. All right. Good stuff. Write your notes. Go study. Read your Bibles more. Look into it. Let's talk about it. You know, uh, Pastor Brian and I are always open and available. You know that. We love these conversations. And... Uh, I know it's a lot to, for some of us to unpack and unlearn. It, look, it took me, you know, Brian's open and transparent about him that it took him, you know, kind of five-year wrestling match and struggle with the process of election and predestination and that doctrine. I can tell you this was a process of like two, three years with me, with the eschatology changing me. Of, and, and just this wasn't someone that taught this to me, and I just said, oh, that sounds better, and I believe that. This was a, a literal two, three, four years, I don't even know, of just reading my Bible and studying this and, and God just pointing out too many problems with me of why I can't believe that other teaching and why I've come to the point I'm at. And so I get it. It's a process. It can take a lot of time, a lot of questions. We want to all be patient with one another. Uh, remember, we talked about it at the beginning, it's not a, it's not a salvation issue, uh, but the, the Lord and the Bible does call us to be knowledgeable and to understand and to be watching but be prepared. So I think that's what we certainly want to be doing. Cool. Matt, would you close us, please? Thank you. Lord, we thank you so much for this morning and just the ability to come here and uh, just fellowship and give your word and, and just learn um, learn about what you have to say for us, Lord. And I pray that uh, you help us to prepare ourselves uh, for your coming. But, Lord, in doing mm-hmm. so, I pray that we, um, we are preparing ourselves each and every day to live our lives here uh, yeah. while we are here and to be a testimony for you. And I just pray to you just to help us each and every day. Um, give us the strength and the ability to, to live our lives the best we can for you. And I pray that we honor you uh, in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, everybody.